Uh, welcome to the Esports Research Report. I'm Dr. Brian McCauley here at the Media Management and Transformation Center in Jenköping in Sweden. And Steph can't be here today, so my co-host is the chairperson and founder of the Esports Research Network, Dr. Tobias Schultz. And our guest today is Mitch McBride, also known as Mitch Mann, who is a shoutcaster for Valoran. So Mitch, welcome aboard and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. I know we've been we've been talking about getting on the podcast together for a while, but schedules have, uh, have clashed. We can finally do it. I'm, as you said, I'm Mitch. I'm a commentator. I've been commentating Valorant since since beta on Counter Strike before that, and uh, really just esports through and through. Born and raised. Well, you're young enough, anyway. And, um, <laughs> so, Mitch, I'll ask the first question. What's your definition of esports? Uh, I guess I've never really thought about it in, in concrete terms, so I'll be a little bit loose on wording, but I would say that so long as you have uh, a, a video game of some description, I'm not sure if chess falls under it, if it's online chess, it's kind of like a gray area, but for the most part, it's a video game played in a competitive environment between individuals or teams competing for something, a prize, could, could be a million dollars, could be an Xbox 360 game. Or it could be a coffee or pride. What about pride? I mean, most of my competitive games with my friends have been for pride. I guess, I guess, yeah. It doesn't have to be a concrete prize pool. Sometimes it's just a fun tournament as well. I guess it goes under it like a more casual esports side of it. I like this definition because it's it's a broader one. It's uh, including everybody. Um, I always hear this quite narrow one where only the one percenter are really competitive esports, but we are all esports. So on the lowest level up to the highest level. Um, yeah. So uh, please tell us more about your journey to esports and how do you became a commentator? Yeah. Uh, well, it was it's kind of a a random story essentially i was you know i was just studying in university uh i was studying math at the time absolutely loved it but i was competing in an, at an amateur level like in these sort of g series nine one tap line these sort of events celtic throwdown as well um so all national irish events with you know maybe two thousand euro as a prize or something like that so we would just go there as a group of buddies one day uh there was an event one tap line up the north and my team fell apart right before it like two guys were supposed to come from the uk they just didn't book flights. The other guys were like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to go play with these other people. So I'd already you know, decided I was going that weekend. So I messaged them. I'm like, hey, do you guys need some help on IT? Like my dad ran an IT business. It's like, I can help you guys out with cabling or something. And they they said, yeah, come on up. We'll see what, what you can do. They took me in uh, casting. Just I said it was marketed to me as because um, I was like, I don't know how to cast. I don't know anything about it. I can't do that. And they're like, look, we have this guy Dinko and he's going to cast and he's amazing. But, he, you know, you can cover for him when he needs a lunch break. And I was like, okay, cool. That sounds good to me, right? <laughs> a little bit of fun, hang out with the guys and chat chat some shit about my uh, my buddies who I was going to be playing against anyway. So it sounded like a fun opportunity. And then from there, honestly, I lose track. It was just a random snowball of amateur events here, there, everywhere about three years ago. And uh, somehow, I, I still can't comprehend it, turned into a, a full-time career along the way. Oh, look, I ended up getting a PhD because I missed my last exam in my master's. So a whole snowball of events. So that's the way things happen. And Tobias, I think you were a journalist in esports and then you decided to study because nobody wanted to read what you were writing or how did that go? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And before that, I got uh, destroyed in Quake and uh, thought about I'm too bad in playing video games. So I write about it and uh, flame other people because they play bad. Mm, that sounds sounds like a Twitch chat experience. I get that. I get that. So we're doing this one on Valorant because, well, I play CSGO. Tobias is former CSGO. He's an Overwatch player. Now, the way we want to ask you this is, how would you describe Valorant to someone who didn't have a clue what Valorant was? I mean, it depends on, depends on their level of understanding, right? If they're a CS player, I'd be like, look, it's, you know, Counter-Strike, Overwatch mixed together. It's very oversimplified, but let's say that's more or less what it is. When you look at uh, talking to my grandmother about it, uh, much tougher to explain for sure. I think then I go for a, a much more simple explanation of, you know, football and you know the way they play football, but people are playing a game and you know the way they commentate football, well, I commentate the game and that's basically it. But uh, yeah, Valorant is on a... If I'm talking to a normal gamer here who just doesn't know it, 
It's a attack FPS game, so tactical shooter where five players compete against another five players to try and one team wants to plant the, the bomb, the spike is what it's called. The other team wants to stop them. That's pretty much it. There's a couple abilities and things like flashbangs, molotovs, all this sort of stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated game when you get into it on a, a deeper level. But on a core level, hey, you got to shoot people in the head and plant a bomb. I mean, I've, I've played it a little bit. Um, someone at Riot actually spent a day running me through it. And, uh, you know, haven't been a noob at CSGO, I found it a little bit easier going into having played CSGO. Yeah. But, I mean, you sort of said the Molotovs and the Flashes there, but isn't it the abilities of the different characters where you've got a kind of Overwatch flavor? Isn't that what distinguishes it? Because, you know, you've got the Smoke, yeah. the Flash, the Molotov, and the Grenade and CSGO, and that's about it. Yeah, I mean, so each... Much for, yeah. But, like, so but, the thing is in Counter-Strike, obviously, uh, I can buy a Smoke, you can buy a Smoke. Everybody can buy every piece of utility. Uh, the only thing that's limited is weaponry. When it comes to the attack or defensive side, you have different weapons. In Valorant, you have the same weapons on both sides, and your abilities are tied to your agent. So you select an agent to start off with, very similar to if people know League of Legends, Overwatch, all that sort of stuff. Your agent has, maybe they smoke, maybe they throw flashbangs, maybe they put down a turret or a trap wire that tells you if someone walks by it, all that sort of stuff. And so you want to, like, assemble your team the right way to have the right abilities for whatever map and strategy you're going to deploy. So it gets very complicated when you look into it on a deeper level, but on the surface level, it can be understood as you want to either plant a bomb or shoot people in the head, and, you know, once the other team is dead, you win. I mean, yeah, I mean, but that whole extra layer strategy that whole picking the team to win i mean you go into a game in csgo you know the, the most you're going to go is oh i'm playing overpass i don't mind using an avp on on long as the ct sure. i mean it's it, i mean does that add a, a big level of depth to you and how you actually commentate on it when you're actually looking at a game beforehand and the lineups and the picking oh yeah i mean one of the standout things for example is if you start out looking at a map where a team has one flasher or um, even better more impactful one smoker so say they're playing with a brimstone and they want to push doesn't matter what map it is doesn't matter what site but they want to push a site obviously you're going to use those smokes to block off angles and make it easier to push in so if at the start of the round somebody the other team gets aggressive and kills that player well then the narrative of the round is going to be okay well now they have to adapt to not having any smokes on a push, how's that going to change their strategy? And looking at, uh, you know, at Counter Strike, for example, you don't have, at least it's not that easy to do because even if you kill someone who has a smoke, that smoke can drop to the floor for a teammate to pick up. Now they've added in a mechanic where you can drop your grenades to each other. So actually, one guy could be sat on the other side of the map with five smokes because they're at his feet. It's just chucking them everywhere. Wait, so wait, wait. Is that a new thing? Is that a new thing? Brand it's new, yeah. That was just I thought added. I just discovered it. Yeah, I was it's going, going to be I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, I was going, no. oh, wow, I never knew this. How could I have missed this for so long? <laughs> yeah, it was in the patch notes there. I think it was last week they put it in. So it's a very fresh addition to the game. Um, but so that just shows how, you know, versatile utility can be in Counter-Strike because, you know, you, you'd never really lose it or... Sure, you do lose it if someone has four grenades. They're only going to drop one. You might not be able to get to their body and yada, yada, yada. But in Valorant, if your smoker dies, you're out of smokes. There's no question about it. Like, no one else can do what that agent can do. So I think that's where the, the depth comes from uh, in terms of even selecting. Which five agents do you take in in the first place? Do you want three smokers? Do you want one? Do you want none? You want to prioritize flashes or people that can take, uh, like, heal themselves? All these sort of things uh, come into play. So um, what I think uh, inter inter is interesting about that, um, that there is a certain complexity in choosing, um, but is there, I mean, League of Legends, you have over 140 heroes, but you oh, yeah. only play a certain part. So do you think in Valorant, you will have a situation where there are too many heroes because it is so different in sense of having ultimates and all that? Yeah, it's uh, this is this is a wing of of the esports. Uh, I would say more generally, even spreading out to games like Rainbow Six Siege, for example, uh, which is the example I'll use for why I think it's going to be a problem in the future. Um, in a game like League, you can do so many things. It's it's a top down MOBA. There's so many different interactions between uh, not just players but also AI. There's not like in Valorant, no matter what abilities you have, you shoot someone in the head, they die. 
it, you can kill them like that. In League, that's that's not a thing, right? It's not how, how it plays out. It's a much more drawn-out combat, which gives you more room to put in abilities that affect that combat in a certain way. Um, in Valorant, the line between a good ability and an insanely overpowered one is very difficult to tread. And I think, you know, we had discussions with Riot where on stream so i can definitely talk about it where we ask them you know is there ever going to be first of all a pick and ban for agents mm -hmm. like are you going to be able to ban agents and pick them in order are we ever going to see them limited so like if i pick a phoenix the other team can't pick a phoenix for Ooh. example because right now you can have the same lineups um because there's too few agents right if you took one out that's pretty unfair um an example would be that if you take a killjoy the other team pretty much has to take a cypher um depending on the map so I think in Valor, and uh, they, they said that there will be six new agents every year, period. That, that is the plan. There is no discussion on changing the plan at the moment, at least, and for the foreseeable, you know, couple of years. So that means that we're going to reach a stage where, let's say, there's 40 agents in there. Now, lots of things can happen in between there. We can have rotations of agents, which I think solves the problem I'm about to raise, which is in Siege, they got to a point where it's like, okay, what do we add in? What agents can we add to unique abilities that don't break the game, but also fit in the game, but don't overcomplicate it? And you end up with these situations where, for anyone that knows Siege, I'll quickly say Thatcher, for example, basically got a, a newer version. I think it's Habana, uh, who does the same thing as him, but in a slightly different way. And I think that's where we're going to have to end up, because in Attack Shooter, f at least for my small brain, there's not that many more things we can realistically do without making it just ridiculously complicated or without exploring these options like having a rotation of agents or having it locked to one agent, you know, uh, only one agent in the game at any one time, so no duplicates. Um, yeah, there are a couple of ways they can approach it, but I, I think it is definitely a problem that has to be very, very carefully handled moving into the future. That said, I thought the problem would have already blown up by now, and the fact that Riot have handled it so well that, sure, Yoru's a bit shit, but other than him, everyone is in a pretty decent spot where I don't feel like anyone is stupidly overpowered. Maybe Jet, but I like that. Okay, but just, so you're playing Valorant, and obviously you have to kind of play as everyone at some stage, right, to keep a handle on it as a, as a shoutcaster. Sure. Who's your favorite, and why? Astra. Uh, I think a Astra right now is just... So Viper for me has always been my bread and butter, but something about how Astra plays, the, the the versatility and flexibility she has, plus I've only started playing her in the last couple of weeks, so she's kind of got that kind of honeymoon period to it. Uh, I think she's really fun, but between herself and Viper and you know, pretty much just Sentinels in general, it's just so much fun to play. But Astra's the one that you can do four different things with the special, right? Yes, yes. So you can do a gravitational well, a stun, a smoke, and then obviously you've got your ultimate, which is the the giant wall. See, I want to I want to start playing, but I was looking up like which characters with, and she was the first character described, and I just went, nope. No, no, and she's, she's not an the angel last level. one. <laughs> no, no. I mean, so look, what? How would you describe the professional scene of Valorant now as it stands? I mean, it's 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 very different depending on what region we're talking about. You know, North America is is cutthroat. They've got the best CS players uh, transferred over because the NACS scene is dead. Valve have done a terrible job of looking after their game in general for the last ever since it was invented. Pretty much, they're very hands off. They don't help to grow it, and so it's gone to shit over there. Um, in Europe. We don't have that situation. I think it's still on life support here. So you end up in a situation where NA has all their best players playing Valorant. So it's hyper competitive. There are 10 teams you could send to international events that would do well. Um, contrast that with Europe. You don't have that same level of depth. We're relying on like our best team right now. Possibly best team in the world is Gambit. And they came from nowhere, basically. They're like brand new players, super, super young. And if they were, you know, if this was 10 years later, I think they'd probably be you know in this sorry they were 10 years older let's say uh they might still be playing counter-strike for for maybe gambit there or some other team so we're kind of fortunate that we have young talent emerging like that so i would say yeah and a hyper competitive eu is like uh growing it's still sprouting right now and we're we're starting to add depth to it still the best region in the world but there's so much further and so much more that we can do and then you look at regions like well let's take oceania they can't even make it into vct now because of some 
travel restrictions and this sort of stuff. So that scene just disappeared. Uh, I think today or yesterday, they um, they announced that the teams won't be going to the last chance qualifier because of COVID complications. So it's uh, Valorant's in a very different place depending on where you live. And you're you're fairly optimistic for it then, that you know that hmm. it's. I mean, this is where you are right now. You're embedded in the professional scene as a showcaster and an analyst, uh, analyst right? Yeah, and, and super privileged to be as well. I mean, the journey over the last year and a half has been fucking unbelievable. Like, r really has been insane. Um, I, yeah, I believe in the game, 100%. I think it's a super fun game. I think it's... The accessibility is always going to be a problem. Uh, an example, when my parents watched me cast Counter-Strike, they sort of got what was happening. Terrorists are the bad guys. They're trying to blow, th blow shit up. Counter-terrorists are trying to stop them, and they're shooting each other, you know? When they throw a grenade, you know what a grenade does. When they throw a flashbang, you kind of get it from the name. A smoke... Yeah, blocks vision all it all makes sense molotov fire is bad um but in valorant it's like yo this girl's throwing a bird out of her hands and it's flying in the air and then it exploded and everyone had yellow orbs on their head and the, what's going on so it, it can be super difficult to to understand what you're looking at um at face value if you don't have any sort of contact experience with it even if you're from a different game it, it, there's an adjustment period uh coming into valorant so that's always going to limit it but I would say the same thing limits League of Legends, and yet, look at where it is. Look at where Dota is. So I, I think we'll get there. So that's that's interesting, as you say, with the idea of Counter Strike in North America is that again, and um, <laughs> I mean the idea. Uh, as we all know, wealth doesn't care. But you also have the idea of Overwatch um, also doesn't care. Um, Activision Blizzard with a league of seventy percent Korean. Um, which is a terrible concept in the end. Um, but it's something underlining where you are always talking about the talent pipeline. We see it in League of Legends is uh, they are mastering it in uh, Europe, always some new players coming out, being 17 years old and beating uh, the big ones. Um, I mean, even though Valorant is quite young, um, do you see something where Riot or the community is nurturing this talent pipeline? Because at, at some point, this hype will slow down and you need sure. people coming up. Yeah, I think that was a huge problem for a long time. Um, now we're seeing much more open, a much more open environment because we have open qualifiers. So to give a brief history of beta, uh, when we were in the beta and when we came into the main game, every event was invite only. And some teams got invited because, let, let me be clear, all teams got invited. 90% nine, of teams, let me be a little bit more fair, 90% of teams got invited because they had an org. Because they had an org with a million followers who would tweet out, yo, you should go watch our game right now. Um, which led Smart. to some teams, I don't want to name... I don't want to name names. I don't want to say Forza, but uh, Forza getting invited to some tournaments. And there were plenty others. I think at one stage I went after NIP, uh, got a lot of shit for that. But th there were a lot of teams being invited to tournaments that did not, fundamentally did not deserve to be there. Now, I'm talking about a year ago. I don't want anyone going yeah, after Coffee and the boys. Um, the, the situation we had back then was ridiculous. Like, if you're looking at it as a CSGO player, unless you have an org that's going to sign you, unless you have someone high profile that will play with you, there was no point in transitioning because you're not going to get into any tournaments, like any at all. So where we're at now, there's open qualifiers. Uh, it kind of sucks because now that open qualifiers are finished for the year, we just had our last one there, uh, well, like a month and a half ago. That leaves us in a position where you've got last chance qualifiers. So that's for teams that are already involved. November, nothing. And December, champions. So if you're a professional team that didn't have a lot of success or are just looking to open a team, you're talking four or five months before you've got a tier one tournament to attend. Uh, unless you want to put yourself at the mercy of Red Bull, We Play, all these sort of blast third party Twitch, third party organizers that will set up their own events. But officially, for the official leagues, you have got four or five months with nothing going on, which is which is pretty crazy. I think that's going to be a, another issue moving forward. But onto the positives, there's been a lot of good steps taken. Uh, I think game changers that just happened this week was the best example. Um, uh, it's not just fostering tier two, tier three talent. It's fostering the whole female scene and then moving into marginalized genders coming into the end of this month um obviously they brought talent on board as well that haven't had a chance like nary sam um i'm gonna pronounce nairi something like that i'm sorry sam uh <laughs> sam 
got brought on. She hasn't got a chance to be on the VCT EMEA streams so far, which is a travesty. Now she actually got to um, go on, do that sort of stuff. Kakuka was commentating with myself. It was a lot of fun. Um, and obviously we had a bunch of teams that wouldn't get a spotlight otherwise now getting to compete uh, in front of an audience in front, on the main Valorant channel as well. So seeing them be that proactive, not just about their tier two and tier three scene, but also about moving into more marginalized genders and trying to foster that scene really fills me with a lot of confidence. Well, we're talking on that. I mean, you know, scientifically speaking, there's absolutely no reason for any gender disparities in terms of esports performance, sure. right? CSGO has obviously had a, a long held tradition, social, cultural values. When guys used to only play League of Legends, I think is a lot better for this sort of stuff. And the values Riot have espoused, like maybe not to buy a thing. But is there a big opportunity for Valorant, especially with the more female characters and not like the really annoying purple haired skin in this terrorist side in, in CSGO that just I had to get rid of her? Chef. Um, but is there more of an opportunity for female teams to come through in Valorant? Is it, you know, potentially the game changer in terms of FPS and uh, a strong female push? I think so on the basis that Riot give a fuck about it and no one else has. Like, up until now, yeah. it's, you know, Valve don't even care about their Tier 1 scene. So I, good luck getting them to support any sort of uh, uh, Tier 2, Tier 3 uh, uplifting. So I think the fact that we have an organizer that values that is insanely valuable also uh you know i think that saying scientifically there's no there's no reason i agree with you on this from where i think you're coming from which is like biologically right like performance they, responses. performance wise exactly but every time i play with a girl and we jump into a ranked you know duo queue get in there hello as soon as you say you know hello oh, what what agent you want to pick something like that as soon as a word comes out of her mouth instantly out of three people, there's always one asshole, at least. And I think about it from my perspective of I've gone into games sometimes and had people of other nationalities. I've spoken and they've just started shouting at me um, and being like, you know, whether it's Ruski or they want you to speak Turkish or whatever it is, that a Spanish, but a German in there. There's assholes everywhere. I mean, you have those games that really sucks. Um, I had three in a row earlier. Three in a row. Like, there you go. One now, asshole imagine. in each team. Imagine you want to solo queue a couple of games and you're a girl and this shit happens to you every single game. Like I genuinely, the majority of girls I play with have voice chat turned off completely. And like, that's insane to have to live like that. Um, to have to think about that every time you go into a game that if you speak, some dude's just going to start jumping on you for no reason, like top fragging, bottom fragging. It doesn't matter. There's always a reason to, to complain. And that that in my opinion is why we end up with such a, a, a negative uh or an absence of female talent because so many girls that otherwise would have went on to become good players just leave after they play a couple because they're like i don't like this i don't like just getting shit on on a on a daily well, basis which you I, need to be able to communicate i mean that's the whole thing the the key yeah, to exactly. winning is calls and information and I've actually got a voice modulator on my computer that I've been intending to use so I can actually play as a girl um, <laughs> oh, to actually God. experience it first firsthand as part of a research project because, you know, I want to see what happens. But I see I've got one friend and she plays. Um, I've never heard her get abuse. She gets guys kind of hitting on her, simping yeah. or something for her, uh, yeah. which is even stranger. And I don't know. So I've never really heard the abuse towards a girl because she's She's the one I play with our team with girls. So it was a team, so it was never abuse. But I know what happens. Sure. I haven't talked to so many. I mean, you know, that's that's just crap. <laughs> that's just yeah. one of the things I hate the most about this. I mean, so what does Riot do to keep the uh, motivation high in the professional scene? What, what sort of things do you see them doing that keeps it all kind of pummeling along? Well, they, they have a lot of contact. Um, so even with even with ourselves, with casters and all the pros are included in it, they get access early to any updates, like when there's a new map, new agent, we get to play test them. Um, they participate in like a bunch of influencer events. They have, so like the, the Twitch event that's coming up now, we have um, a bunch of things, a bunch of opportunities for, for the community to kind of get together on like a you know pro player influencer commentator these sort of things and we're all inter uh, intertwined for a little bit every you know month or two we're all jumping on it and doing that sort of stuff then there's the the tournaments like game changers and stuff that that boosts up the lower levels um that's what's the name of the tournament um 
I think the Pro Tour, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but there's a, a bunch of regional tournaments. So for French players where like your core three need to be French, your core three need to be Spanish or whatever. We don't have an Irish one, sadly, because there would just be one team. But, uh, you know, we're, we're getting there. We'll work on that slowly, but surely. Uh, so, yeah. Mammy, like, Mammy, you want to play? <laughs> jump on. Yeah. It's your friends. Come on. But no, we're, we're, we're in a situation where like it just feels like they care and like you're listened to. And for example, most of us that are involved closely with Riot, have contact to feedback things like bugs in the game maybe like you know people are being racist or whatever in in the lobbies as happens you know we we have facilities to report that uh more directly as opposed to just filling out a, a report within the game and just feeling heard like that feeling like a developer it's actually going to commit some resources if you have a problem uh to fixing it or if you identify a problem to, to helping that get seen is an, invaluable to actually make you give a shit and stick around engagement it's, it is. it's also a super easy thing to do i mean i'm always yeah. baffled by the idea that other publisher like wealth and blizzard are doing such a terrible job with that just listen to people and um but on that topic i mean um we saw or we see where riot is going with league of legends in this franchising system and all um with its issues as well uh, in terms of longevity and sustainability. Um, what yeah. do you think where Riot would want to go? Uh, and where uh, do you want to go? Yeah, C considering how things work down in League, I think that an ultimate goal is probably to move towards franchising, um, uh, unless League reverts at some stage. Um, I, I haven't thought too much about it i know that if you know for example it, how we work right now is so far there's been a lot of from homework um but now we're starting to travel more with masters with lcq uh you know moving uh, sorry constantly traveling to germany if it was franchised i know it would impact me because uh if i was to be a part of the franchise then we would have to move to wherever it was presumably berlin is a hot spot but that's not so bad. Uh, no, no, not the end of the world. I'll say that. But it, it, for me, I'm not sure what's better. Uh, I don't know a whole bunch about franchising. Like I was around the Overwatch scene, around League of Legends, or like I'm surrounded by a lot of people who are in the League of Legends scene. So I have a very vague surface level understanding, but I'm not sure what's best for the scene, especially in terms of growth. I feel like for me, my impression, my uninformed opinion on it, is that franchising locks out a lot of smaller teams like it it almost immediately damages your tier two and tier three scene which is something riot are actively trying to as we've just talked about actively trying to grow so it would be a weird one for me if we ended up franchising in the near future um but who knows well tobias would know a little bit I, i'm like you i think a lot of people you know, don't know what's best. I mean, it's one of the difficulties of esports is what should we do? How do we grow this? And Tobias, what, would you, what do you think? Give us your thoughts on franchising versus the way it is. I mean, it's it's the interesting part where we see even uh, uh, LEC um, has already its problems with their franchising, with their lower teams not gathering fans and all. A good example is Carmin Corp, the, the French organization in um, winning the EU Masters having a huge crowd of people, a uh, huge gathering of French audience. It would be amazing to have them in the LEC, but suddenly you, the slots are full. So um, as you were saying, there is a certain timing where you can do it. Maybe even for League of Legends, it was too early, probably. And that's the part where uh, you see with Overwatch starting out as a franchise, uh, destroying it, it's tier two in that path. And uh, therefore, uh, I'm curious uh, about that because there is nowhere written that if you are doing it that way, your next game has to do be that way. And Counter-Strike yeah. worked with this uh, touring system like golf and tennis. And uh, I'm curious about that. I see that Valorant may be a better game for such a system where you're touring from one Masters to the next Masters to the next Masters to the big Masters in December. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at, where I like how open we currently are. Again, kind of sucks that we end up with four months or so of, of not very much going on, um, a couple of tournaments here and there. 
But I think that as the scene grows, that problem is going to iron itself out. It's not really that big of an issue, especially seeing organizers like Blast come back now for the Twitch event. You know, we're starting to see a lot more, a lot more um, engagement around the sort of external organizers. So I think for me, again, uninformed opinion, but I like the fact that we have open qualifiers. I've always loved open qualifiers. I think imagining coming from Counter Strike, imagining a scene that doesn't have that, that if myself and four friends, you know, maybe I've got to change my genetics a little bit, but if myself and four friends make a pro team and we want to jump in and become the best, we can. That's actually what got me into Counter-Strike in the first place. I remember watching a major where Renegades played. I, I mm. Sadly, Sadikus told Sponge this story. I remember seeing Sponge get knocked out and um, like completely destroyed on... Uh, I think he was playing for Vox at the time, actually. But anyways... They got wrecked, and they still made uh, whatever it was, say 10k or something. I was in school at the time. 10k between five people—that's that's a gold mine. So I was like, guys, listen, this team goes every every major. They're going to these events. They're getting knocked out immediately, winning nothing, and they get a load of money. Let's do it. Let's make a team, guys. Let's go. We can be better than them. Yeah, they ranked in at silver. Uh, things didn't go well to start with, you know. Got to got to level 10 eventually, but yeah, that's like the whole um. The, the whole system as it is, is very complex and definitely out of my my knowledge pool. But from my perspective, open qualifiers, hope they stick around. Okay, so which which is it going to kill first? Will Valorant kill Overwatch or will it kill CSGO <laughs> yeah. first? Which you reckon? I don't know. I think it's like, uh, it's like soccer being the GAA killer, you know? It's like uh, they're very different things for very different audiences. And uh, there's no reason that both can't be enjoyed for me i don't enjoy counter-strike anymore i find it too boring but with all the changes that have come through i have a feeling that you know in the next year or so i might actually start enjoying it again and all my friends still work in counter-strike so you know it's it's i gotta gotta cast an eye over every now and then but for me like i don't think valorant could kill overwatch because i think they're doing a pretty good job of just destroying <laughs> that themselves <laughs> yeah i mean over i mean have you tried the short matches on CSGO, first to nine rounds? No, I I have probably played four games of Wingman in the last year, and other than that, I don't think I've I don't think I have CS installed on my PC right now. Let me double well, check. You're really dedicated. I mean, what I like is the new map insertion too, because it's set in Sweden. So I I almost learned the word for ah. in Swedish again. But it's got the co-op, <laughs> which is one of the local stores. And I looked at it for five different goals, and it's a brilliant map. And I was going wait a second, this is Sweden. And oh my God, it took me way too long to notice the Swedish language in the co-op. Um, all right, so just want a couple more questions. I mean, so being a shoutcaster and a commentator for Valorant, what's your favorite part? Is it the live action talking about it or is it the in-depth looking at it? Gary Neville on um, Andy Gray oh. on the on the IT, you know, up, up in the game of football analysis. Mm -hmm. Are you... Are you doing that in terms of esports analysis? Are you the Gary Neville of, of esports? <laughs> I know. I don't think I'm the Gary Neville of anything, to be fair, but maybe one day. Uh, I That's a very good question because I love I love both. I mean, I worked with a, a team as an analyst for a bit, but on broadcast analysis is obviously a completely different world. Uh, it's a much easier world, for sure. I love doing breakdowns. Like I got to do one um, to cover for someone at Masters, and it was so much fun just being on the screen, drawing, being like, hey, look what's that? Look what they're doing here. And given that extra insight that I get to notice, um, just like sitting in the truck with production as well, chatting through, like, it, I love that side of things, 100%. Um, does, it, does your math brain, does your, you were going to study quantum physics for anyone who didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, PhD. Oh, sorry, uh, esports research report calling me a uh, nerd. Yeah, I get to go backstage to major events. You'd be sitting in the lab looking at other nerds talking bullshit. True. Um, that's what you'd be doing. <laughs> String theory. Uh, but like, but waves that, and probability. But yeah, but does, does that sort of stuff uh, help you? Does, 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 your kind of mathematical brain, does that help you look at angles? Does it help you play even? Uh, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know that. The math has ever helped, but certainly the lecturers that I met and the teachers I met, the, when you're teaching someone math, you teach them how to think about things as well, how to think about problems. And I think extensive study of mathematics and science changed 
the way I look at things. I'm a very um, energetic, very emotionally driven human being. And it's, you know, helped me to tame that somewhat. If you ask anybody I hang out with at events, it hasn't helped to tame it. But uh, I guarantee it has. <laughs> it would have been so it, much worse it, otherwise. Is yours not being Irish? Because I kind of get the same complaint. A bit too be. emotional, a bit too over the top for an academic. Yeah. It could a be. Bit too excited, <laughs> but it could be a national trait. Come on, let's we'll have great crack, whatever we're doing. I mean, I kissed the Blarney Stone when I was a kid, so really, that was where so I fucked up. You got cold sores. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> after, like immediately. <laughs> the second I was Wait, coming let's, back let's, from let's, it. we got to stop the Irish stuff. We'll get out of control here. Poor Tobias is looking <laughs> scared right now. I have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a, There's yeah. a stone. We all kiss it. That's all you need to know. And if you ever catch me and Mitch at a bar at around one o'clock in the morning, you will definitely have no idea what we're talking about because <laughs> that is our curse. Every people yeah. smile and go, he seems to be having fun talking to me. Um, I mean, so that could be a quite interesting observation for intercultural management or whatever. Listen, just for if research you're purposes. Me an excuse to have a tax write off on a night out. Let's go. I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. We'll, we're going to have uh, we're having our first conference in December. But uh, in the 2022, I'm pushing to have it here at DreamHack in the city of Ian Shepping, which we're going to have to buy us. I mean, obviously, put to vote what's going to happen. Um, so you can come and be a keynote speaker at the conference next year and Sounds show good. off your Valorant skills at DreamHack. So <laughs> the last... <laughs> Mitch, come over. We're going to go into beer. Um, <laughs> nobody watches from work. Um, so last question we have is... Um, what sort of things would you like research? You know, we have every sort of researcher under the sun from performance to gender to, to technology to, you know, legal. What, if you were said, what does need to be researched in esports? What topics would you like to send a crack team of proper nerds to pursue? You know, that, that, that is, that is a very tough question. There's so many things that could be looked into. And I think just based on our conversation today and, you know, recent conversations being had around game changers and the adjustments being made. I would love to look at an actual in-depth analysis of the difference between uh, between the female scene and the male scene when it comes to to Valorant attack FPSs. And more directly, I'd love to see the differences in attack FPS versus a MOBA like League of Legends uh, in terms of participation of different minorities and and. Uh, sort of how it's affected by maybe the style of game maybe which actual game it is and also just more information around because i i've heard it so many times the whole thing of well, women just aren't as good as men at video games it's like well can, can you actually draw up a statistic or a peer-reviewed study that proves that and if not what what are you talking about bro like uh, i'm just gonna start talking hey this dude's got green eyes so he's gonna be better people with green eyes are better at video games like what are you talking about and I get it. It's like drawn sort of from like um, studies around reaction time and, and these sort of things. But man, I, I I don't believe in any of that shit. I think that for for me, I have ideas on why it would be, and uh, you know, a lot of mine, as we discussed, base around the experience of being a female within Valorant or any sort of game with voice chat is horrendous. Uh, being a female on the internet, let's just say, let's leave it there. So I think that that's I think anyone that's, on the internet. These days. True, true. Uh, but a anyone who has that that doesn't fit the norm, right? If you're like, if you're thinking about the internet, you're thinking about yeah. white males, right? Pretty much, if you're different than that. Well, then easy target. You know, they're they're coming for you. And I think, but I honestly, I think Valorant's pretty good in in terms of like our pro scene and stuff like that. I think there's so much support there, way more than what I've seen in other games, and particularly in Counter Strike, which does definitely feel more like. Kind of a boys club than valorant which feels more open but obviously reddit twitch chat all you still have dickheads there they're always going to be there unfortunately no way around it i i think you, i think you nailed an actual study i think you actually did put your your finger on the pulse of something that'd be very valuable is looking at the female experience in different scenes or in different cultures but i mean it's, it's a global scene and that's a really um, great idea for someone doing a PhD or a research paper, or even a bachelor's or master's thesis, which is why we do this podcast. Tobias, do you have any final questions for my countryman here? I mean, I, I find it uh, fascinating, as you were saying, that there are so many facets into it. Um, what Recently, I had a class with uh, 
two female and 10 male students. And the discussion came up as well. And the whole discussion was about the idea. I mean, in the end, if we talk about probability, there needs to be one female just out of probability. There needs to be one female at the top. And if we are looking at that, we have one person in Hearthstone winning a tournament, one person in StarCraft. Okay, Overwatch failed miserably, but we had a, a female person. But besides that, no one. So um, as you're saying, there are so many social values or social aspects in it uh, that are barriers. So uh, yeah. I liked it in that, um, especially the idea it should be the way. But what would you say um, what we as players could do as community? Because it's, if it's social, if it's social barriers, we need to do something. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of awkward as well, though, because if you think about it, you load into a game. Uh, your solo queue is a girl solo queue. She speaks, someone goes after. Now, the normal thing to do there, thing you do in person probably, is to turn around and be like, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? You do that. Your game's ruined. That that dude's he's gone. He's gonna just flame both of you. Then the rest of the game, other two are probably gonna jump in as well. You know, words white knight are gonna be thrown around, and it all goes to shit. You might as well abandon that game right away. Get into another one. It's it's really tough on the internet because people don't actually listen to you. Like when you when you say something like, uh, you know, dude, why, why are you being an asshole? <laughs> they, they don't hmm. listen to what you said. They're just like, oh, this guy, this guy wants to mess with me. Okay, time to start shouting at him. Um, it's you know, there's, there's a great solution. It's called the mute button. I've learned exactly. that from people. First round, exactly. someone's an asshole. You go mute it and you tell everyone else, you should mute him. He's an yeah. asshole. Yeah, I think uh, like for the for the most part, there's no team damage in Valorant as well. So they can't they can't just shoot you. I mean, they can use abilities on you. So if it's a it's a raise, maybe be a little bit careful. But for the most part, yeah, it's it, it's so tough. I think it's like way out of my wheelhouse in terms of coming up with solutions to it because yeah, even in my lobbies when I try it, it's I haven't found any sort of successful method. One thing I will say, and a really interesting point you just brought to my mind, the fact that we have a female competing top level StarCraft, top level Hearthstone, individual games, right? What stops them in in a, a attack FPS in a team based game? Well, I can tell you, I back when I was doing Counter Strike maybe two three years ago. I was reaching out to a bunch of female pros when I was doing the league because I was like, dude, you're you're sick. You know, honestly, like, what do you think is the barrier? Because the same kind of conversation came up around then. It was Copenhagen Games was on and there's a female tournament and a regular tournament. And I think that, or an, I don't know exactly what we should call them, like not limited tournament, right? A completely open one. And yeah. um, the, I was just asking, you know, like how come we have these sick female players, uh, but None of them, literally none, ever transitioned to a mixed team. Now, eventually Mimi did, and she went to Copenhagen Flames and played in a mixed team. But before that, like you're talking 2019, there were none. And it blew my mind. And I literally had some female pros tell me that they had trialed for teams. They had been told like, hey, you did a great job. We loved you. They had moved forward. And then a barrier had come either from the coach, from the organization, from someone like that saying, we're just not sure we want to like some of the guys don't want to play with a girl or we're not sure how the team house would work and all this sort of stuff. It was like, dude, come on. What do you, do you not hire gay players? Are you not going to get two gay? What if they start fucking, you know, like it, it's absolutely insane to me to turn around and be like, yeah, but like you're a girl and they're guys. So yeah, we don't think that'll work. And they never told me what organization said that thankfully, because I don't, I don't. Think I'd be able to hold <laughs> that in, but um, yeah, it like that sort of environment to me, it just, it makes it so tough. That's why I kind of like what game changers are doing. I don't know if you know this, but as I said, there's going to be a, a, a marginalized gender tournament uh, coming up at the end of October. Right. It's very controversial right now. And they're saying like maybe it shouldn't be a game changers tournament. It should be a separate one and blah, blah. But as a core idea, I like the fact that they are limiting it to you have to have three women on the team and the other two players can be of any gender. So they can be male players. They can be non-binary. They can be whatever. And to me, that promotes integration. The first thing you're going to do is go snipe the best players from the main league. So in this case, the best two male players you can, merge them with three females, go into the tournaments. That's not ideal because uh, it's in some instances, you think about bringing someone like CNET in, he's smurfing. Uh, actually, he's smurfing no matter where he goes. If he plays in the <laughs> grand finals of the world championship, he's still smurfing. But uh, it can cause some complications, sure. But my point is that it promotes integration because you now have two players 
probably from the the main league so you two male players who are playing with females it normalizes that instantly when you yeah. see that on a consistent basis which Modeling. i think is a good thing but you know I, again what the hell do i know <laughs> yeah but that's that's the part which i don't understand in management research there is such a lot of research and peer reviewed and all that says mixed teams are better in sure. so many ways more innovative more creative more efficient more uh, less conflict and all that and suddenly you're copying it in a, a context where it would be perfect because in the end, if nothing is uh, from the technical or physical barrier, suddenly uh, you have the perfect field and we are mm -hmm. still 20 years later, not at that place that, uh, I mean, it is enforced. I love the idea that uh, you have free female and two whatever, non-binary or male, uh, but it will be male in the end. Um, and it needs to be enforced. Honest. It needs to be enforced. So it, that's the weird part. Um, I don't need an answer on that because I don't have an answer. No, on so that. You got to stop now. Okay, this yeah. is our new podcast. Look, at the end of the day, we're in a world where doing your own research means Googling for the information you need to avoid getting vaccinated and dang, dying from COVID-19. I mean, that's the world we live in and that's the <sighs> thing it is. But look, Mitch, thank you very much. Uh, you've helped us understand Valorant. And I'm going to be hitting you up uh, in private for some tips on which players to start playing with because I'm getting a little bit bored of CSGO myself, especially Hell after yeah. three assholes in a row today. But um, so anyone that is listening to podcast, anything that Mitch uh, wants you to follow him on is below the video or below the podcast. Thank you very much, Mitch. No problem at all. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure.